not, I, I get that, but this is, I'm just trying to teach you journalism. So I went to journalism school. This is not how it works when you make news videos. A source tells you something, you fact check it or else you don't include it. Like you cannot just include some random comment from someone without and without verification of it. You, I mean, and maybe that's when you get back on camera and say, we cannot confirm that. That's what Todd is saying. That's what 60 Minutes would do. I mean, are you, you're saying you're, you're you're making a documentary sure yeah you know i think it's a good thing you guys are doing this honestly just because i mean i know some other people have gotten hosed probably worse than i have but okay. still even at that i mean it's probably 20 grand that i've sunk into a property that i'm going to end up losing um because of you know uh being misled i guess is the best thing best way to put it but yeah i just want to really just want to do this just to make sure that other people are aware uh, before they they jump on anything like this yeah what i find interesting about some of your comments is um <clears throat> even to this day as someone who's already gone through the process and in your own words it was not a positive experience for you uh you're still kind of hoping that maybe not everything was his fault or believing a little bit of you know what he's saying that not everything was his fault the, the big crux of Clayton's argument uh, with a lot of the class action lawsuit issues that you had mentioned is that down in Indianapolis, Clayton had put a lot of trust into a gentleman by the name of Burt Whalen, who ran a company called Ocean Point. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clayton's whole defense is that uh, he wasn't involved with a lot of the issues that folks had. And there's allegations of a Ponzi scheme and rents not being uh collected, um, renovations not being performed, things of that nature. Um, and Clayton has never denied that those things have happened, but his, his big defense has been, I didn't have anything to do with it. I was also duped by this guy, Burt Whalen and his company, Ocean Point. What I find really interesting about your story, Brent, is you didn't buy a property from Morris Invest in the Indianapolis market. Your property's in the Detroit market, which had nothing to do with Burt Whalen or his company, Ocean Point, but yet you've had some negative experiences. I only invested in one property with Morris Invest. Um, thankfully, I wanted to make sure I did my due diligence before going further. Um, and I put uh, cash uh, 46,900 bucks into that first property upon an initial acquisition. Were you originally planning on uh, buying more than one rental property and something gave you pause or was your intention to just buy one to see how it went? No, my original intention was to buy more, but I wanted to play this out and just see how it went. How much money are you going to lose on this investment with Morris Invest? Well, what it's looking like I'm going to lose once I sell, you know, hopefully here in the next month, is that uh, I'm going to lose about eight grand on um, the price differential from acquisition to sales price. Uh, I'm losing money. It's actually depreciated in value. And also with all the repairs that have been in, I'm about 12 grand in the hole. So all in, you know, in the cash flow over the course of holding this too has not been positive. It's been slightly negative. So I think I'm just right at $22,000 in the hole with this uh, beginning to end with this investment. But even from the very beginning, there were some red flags, some caution flags that kind of made me step back a little bit. So I let it play out longer, even though they were sending more deals my way continually, just to see how that first property was going to really pan out in the long run. And thankfully I did because uh, I would have lost a lot more money if I would have kept investing. How, what red flags did you see that gave you pause? Well, I mean, the, the first big red flag that gave me pause was I didn't receive a, an initial rental check for probably two to three months after buying the property. And there was supposed to already be a tenant in place. And then when I started doing some digging, I found other uh, things that I've been misled on throughout the acquisition process that uh, then uh, allow me to take a further step back and evaluate, you know, all the other uh, issues that were in play. What other things were those? Well, what happened was when I went through the first uh, initial steps of vetting properties and looking at properties that they had, uh, you get the, the kind of performance sheet that they send you. Uh, the one particular property that really interested me was a property in Detroit and it was advertised at 800 bucks a month in rental income. And then it was a, uh, purchase price of 46,900. I thought the price to rent ratios looked pretty good. Uh, later on down the line, I found out that uh, the rental income that had been received on that property was only 700 bucks a month and not 800. 
And upon talking to the property manager, they informed me that Morris Invest told them to keep collecting 700 and see if they could increase that to 800 over the course of the year. And so they just went ahead and advertised it at 800 as opposed to 700 they, they had been receiving. So you were given notice from them that the official marketing stance from Morris Invest was to advertise the property at a higher rate than it was actually receiving? That is correct. Yep. They told the management company to continue to collect 700, even though they had advertised it at 800. And they told them if you can over the course of the next year, see if you can increase that to 800. So it was a complete fabrication up front on the performance sheet. And you did not find out that the rent was lower until after you had closed on the property? That's correct. It was probably maybe three to four months in after closing the property that I found this out. I started doing due diligence with the property manager asking a lot of questions. And I also found out that the tenant was not an employee where they said she was an employee. They said she was an employee of Google. Turns out she was unemployed and living with her mother from time to time. The mother was living in the house with her. So there was just a, the situation wasn't what it was portrayed to be. Now, when you say they said she was a, an employee of Google, who specifically is they? Is that Morris? Yeah, when I'm, when I'm mentioning, when I'm saying that, whenever I go through the process of, and I was working with an investment counselor with Morris Invest, so it wasn't Clayton Morris himself. It was a, a guy named James who's on their team. Um, he was sending me details of the properties as I was vetting them. And so this particular property was advertised at 800 bucks a month, market value of 46,900, and the tenant was a Google employee in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This was in the Detroit market. And so the, the, the fact that she was a Google employee was false, and the fact that the rent being collected was 800 bucks a month was false. I presume after you found out that the rent was actually $100 a month less than Morris Invest Company had advertised to you, and you also found out that they had advertised to you she had a job working for you know a very prominent company, Google. Uh, I, I presume you are a obviously upset, and b you probably reached out to Morris Invest uh, to ask him to rectify the situation. What happened when you reached out to him? Yeah, that was correct. After I found out that I was being misled, I reached out, sent a letter to the the gentleman I was working with, their investment counselor, and I said, you know what, uh, this hasn't been working out. I've found these details and this information that has proven to be false from what you presented to me. It's like, can you guys rectify the situation? I'd like to just get this property off my hands. You know, if you can sell it to someone else or you can buy it back, whatever you have to do. Um, I, once I sent that email within probably two hours time, I got a call from Clayton and he was Clayton asking himself himself. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. He was asking me, you know, what was going on and he wasn't aware that there was an issue with the property and he was going to try to correct the situation. Um, and so we got off the phone. He, was, he said he was going to do some digging and, and look into it. And I guess he did. Um, they told me that he was going to send me a check to make up for the past rent payments that I hadn't been receiving. So I did receive a check. And this was, I closed in August of 2017. This was in February of 2018 that I received just out of the blue a $4,000 check in the mail. I think to try to make amends you know, but we still were dealing with the problem tenant. I was trying to go through the eviction process and, and there was no, I, I guess on their end, I don't think there was any kind of attitude towards like, okay, we'll try to buy this property back or anything like that. This was just a band aid, I think to throw at the problem. To me, it felt like it was just, okay, we get it. We messed up. Um, Let's we'll see if we can make things right. And here's the money to do so. And, and it just wasn't nearly enough to cover anything. And and I was still dealing with a lot of headaches that I, I wasn't expecting to be dealing with. And it was just an ongoing issue even from there. Where are you at with the investment today? Well, where I'm at today with the investment is that I'm still holding it, but I do have it on the market. It looks like it's getting ready to sell to someone else now. Um, once I got the problem tenant out in 2018, which the eviction process drug on forever, they would make a payment, you know, and, and kind of just hold us over for a little bit and make another payment two months later. Um, but we finally got them out after about six or seven months. What I, what I decided to do then, since the management company wasn't really that bad, they were fairly responsive. They were trying to help me out in the situation. We just put, I decided to put some money into it to fix it up a little bit, you know, make it look good, advertise it, see if we can get a, a really good quality tenant in place. 
So I spent at that point in time, probably about eight grand in just fixing up the bathroom and, you know, painting the walls, redoing the carpet, uh, some, some roofing issues needed to be repaired. And then we finally got a good tenant in place in August of that year. Um, and just tried to stabilize the property. So we, we found someone uh, in that can, that was paying and they've been paying ever since, but the property itself has continually given us issues. So now all in, I'm looking at about $12,500 I've put into the property just to keep it up to code, uh, to keep uh, maintenance uh, on the property in place so I can keep the tenant there. There was just a, I can go on the laundry list of items. There was a the AC unit was bad. Uh, a lot of the roofing was bad. There was holes in the wall. There was a lot of leaks that we weren't aware about. The, the windows were bad, needed to be replaced. Um, none of this stuff was addressed upon acquisition acquisition, and didn't, wasn't discovered until the next year whenever I had the problem tenant out and I started really doing some assessments to see what kind of condition the, the property was in. Now, now that deferred maintenance you, you spoke about that wasn't addressed at acquisition, right? The home, you purchased it. I don't remember the exact amount you said, but it was in the mid 40s somewhere. Um, so when, you know, you're buying an investment property, right, for a value that low, um, there is, you know, some deferred maintenance that one would expect. And not every property needs to be sold to someone um, in 100% perfect condition, right? You take the Detroit market where you're buying it, the properties are older, right? They're probably 80 years old uh, or more. So not every property is going to be perfect. But what should always happen during any sale, of course, is a complete and transparent um, offering, right? That you need to know what you're buying. There's nothing wrong with buying a fixer upper so long as you know that you're buying a fixer upper. Do you feel that Clayton Morris and his team were transparent with the condition of the property when you were buying it? No, I, I don't believe there was transparency there at all throughout that process because what I was told through the investment counselor was when I was to acquire this property and, and the pictures I got were, were, they weren't detailed. You didn't get to see a lot. I got to see it from Google maps view and I, I, I did some evaluation on the location. But what I was told was that once I closed on the property, there would be a rehab process of about two to four weeks to getting the property spruced up, you know, in good condition. It needed to, there needed to be some repairs, but I asked specifically for a sheet of the repairs that were to be made. And I didn't get that sheet. Um, and so as I was checking on the property, even af after acquisition, uh, they told me they were going to keep me updated on what was happening. I didn't get an email. I didn't get a phone call, you know, for two or three weeks. So I eventually reached out to them and said, Hey, what's happening? You know, I haven't seen, received a rent check. I haven't heard from anyone about what was going on with the um, repairs. And then they told me, they, I heard back that all that needed to be done was replacement of a water uh, heater in the building. And so I was under the assumption that there was going to be a, a pretty thorough, you know, uh, renovation done to the home to really spruce it up. But instead, all I got was the water heater. And again, I should have done my due diligence to really dig into this process beforehand. But I put a lot of faith and trust into the system. And that was on my own fault. And I'm something I kicked myself for. But it was told to me that there would be a two to four week renovation process that will should. Uh, and that was going to be a part of the acquisition price. That, that should increase the equity into the property, um, neither of which really happened. Now, uh, obviously, you know, uh, I'm in the real estate business. We sell properties and we have construction and all of that stuff as well. It's very common uh, in the real estate industry, especially the rental property industry, uh, for people to, to renovate properties. But what is almost completely unheard of um, except for the, the stories we're hearing about the Morris Invest Company and all of the investors, it is selling a property, telling investors that they're going to need to do a renovation, collecting that money as part of the purchase price, and then not even including a line-by-line -line scope of work in regards to what needs to be done. That is just not, not normal in our industry. Do you feel like Clayton Morris and his company specifically targeted investors who may not know that and perhaps had their guards down? Like, did you know at that time that it was not an industry norm to agree to purchase a property up front that's going to have a generalized renovation but never actually be given that list? Like, did you know any of that at this time? 
I, I don't think I knew at that time that that was the norm to not receive the list of renovations to be done. And quite frankly, at that point in time, I feel like I was a bit naive just because I had some blind faith and trust into the system. I mean, they're pretty good at getting you hyped up and these properties are going to perform for you. You know, we're going to put some work into it. You're going to build some equity. You know, by the time, you know, the repairs are done, the home value is going to be higher than what it was whenever you purchased it. You know, these are all the, the things that you're kind of told. And so I put some trust into the system, which I'm kicking myself for, obviously. But yeah, it, it could be, I think that they're targeting people who maybe just buy into the enthusiasm and into the sales pitch there. Uh, because in hindsight, yes, I wish I would have been firm on the fact that I need to see the detail of what's going into that, you know, uh, into the repairs of the property, but I didn't. And I think there's probably a lot of other people who were in the same boat as me. You've referenced several times that you were hyped into the system. Now that hyping is, a, do you think a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, you've probably seen Clayton on TV, you know, on Fox news for, uh, you know, close to 20 years? <laughs> Maybe so. I mean, it wasn't that I really watched Fox news. It was more so that I had heard him on an interview with bigger pockets uh, maybe eight months prior to reaching out to Morris invest. And it just seemed like he was a genuine guy and, and, uh, and, uh, no, maybe he is, maybe this isn't, you know, all entirely his fault, but at the same time, I think you have to be aware of what your business is doing. Um, and I did, uh, have kind of blind trust into, into the, to the system, maybe because I had heard him before. I was like, there's some legitimacy with that name because he's been on TV. You know, he's been on this, uh, you know, uh, what I, I consider a respected podcast in bigger pockets. Um, so I didn't, at least I didn't think that I was going to be misled. And it could be probably because I've just heard him numerous times before on different venues. If, if you had the opportunity to speak to Clayton right now today, what would you say to him? Well, I, I, I would hope that he's straightened out some of the missteps that he's done. Um, and probably done to many investors. And, and by what I'm seeing, I know there's a class action lawsuit against him, all this stuff. So I'm not the only one who I feel like has probably been wronged in this manner. But if he needs to try to find a way to, I think, make amends with not just the investors, but everyone else he's misleading, maybe on his podcast. And also, I mean, it's, I'm a financial planner. In our world, we have to give disclosures continually about, you know, uh, what to expect and what not to expect with what you're hearing, what information we're giving um, to blindly just be able to give information and facts and figures to people without portraying also the risks involved, I think uh, shows a little bit of a lack of character. So hopefully he's, he can clear that up on his end. So given that he has, he's in the middle of all these, these legal situations and um, he's now chosen to leave the United States of America. Do you think that he'll ever actually make amends to yourself and a lot of the other investors who've been harmed working with this company? I highly doubt it. I mean, that, that's, that's something that I'm sure it's just a, you know, it, it's a pipe dream, but you know, I hope at least, you know, he can, he can stop, you know, marketing what he's marketing through his podcast. I know he has a pretty good following with that podcast, unfortunately. Um, but if you know you're in hot water, you know, just stop and maybe you apologize. You know, that's the least you can do. But um, you know, stop, stop sending this message out there and stop at least trying to send people to your company because it's not working, obviously. You know, you have these legal situations that have popped up. So maybe the, the best way he can make amends is just by stopping, you know, what he's doing. Stop the marketing, apologize, you know, try to at least correct, of course, correct the, what you're doing right now. Even though I don't think there's, for us and people who have gotten, you know, are, are on the raw end of these deals, uh, there's probably no hope for uh, financially getting amends, but it would at least make me somewhat happy to hear him at least stop, apologize, and just admit, you know, everything that's happened. And, and, and it is, you know, uh, even though he says it's, it's so-and-so and so-and-so -so else, Ocean Point, you know, it falls on your shoulders whenever this is your client base that has to deal with those repercussions. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.